Okay, good morning, everyone. It's just a little bit past 10 o'clock, so we'd like to get moving this morning. I do want to welcome everyone to our HR update, adjusting to a remote workforce. Um, I think it's something that everyone has been challenged with over the past couple of weeks. So we're definitely excited to bring some updates and hopefully shed some light on some best practices uh, and some advice from some excellent HR professionals that we have on the line today. So just a reminder, so the information provided here is not intended for legal or accounting advice. So just make sure that you're consulting with your own advisors for specific advice around any legal or accounting practices. Um, as always with, with the audio, we are getting some feedback that it is much better through a phone. So if you can follow along on your computer and then dial into the phone line, I think that's the, the best of all worlds. Um, we are going to be taking some questions, some live Q&A throughout this webinar. So I will ask that if we hang on um, until we get into it a little bit, just so we can make sure that we keep the flow of our meeting going. And I, we are handling a lot of topics today, so we just want to make sure we get through that. So I would like to take this time to welcome our panelists. So Laura Neustad, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief HR Officer at Cape Cod 5. Lauren Mahoney, who's the Vice President of Benefits, Compensation, and Employee Relations at Rockland Trust. Jen Pinkham, who's the founding partner of Pfeiffer Pinkham. She's been a, a mainstay here on these webinars. And then Allison McEachern, who's our Chief People Officer internally at Rogers Gray, uh, who a lot of our clients that might be on the, the call right now have met before. So we're super excited to have everybody on here. This is a little bit of the agenda we're going to go over. I think the, the, the main one at the top is stress. I know everyone's feeling it right now. Um, so we are going to dive in, do a little bit of, of commiserating amongst the panelists as to, you know, what they're seeing from a stress standpoint and how they're handling it internally with their own HR department. So you as HR professionals, how to help manage some stress. Uh, the biggest thing is the new communication now, dealing with a remote workforce, potentially, um, you know, employees that haven't been remote before, administrating all of these new things, you know, administrating leave, best practices around communicating, tracking all the new things going on with your leave requests. And then now that the FFCRA has started, um, I think we're gonna just spend a little bit of time talking about best practices on how to administer those new paid leave benefits. So obviously we're gonna kick off here because I think this is something that everybody feels right now. So before we kind of get into the communication, administration, blocking and tackling challenges, um, I think we might as well start with the stress problem. So obviously it's, it's a major stress throughout our economy and really the HR professionals, you guys are handling the brunt of it. So what we wanted to do is actually give our panelists a minute just to talk about um, what they're dealing with for stress and maybe some best practices on how to handle it internally. So um, Laura, would you like to kick off the, the stress topic? Certainly, thank you, Jeff. So, you know, kind of following the mantra that change is hard and people are messy, you know, we couldn't be in, you know, kind of a, the trifecta of everything that is happening um, to our organizations and um, HR professionals uh, today. I mean, the events that are unfolding, you know, the ever-changing um, needs of our organization, needs of our communities, um, and all the planning that we've put in probably in the past in terms of managing, you know, typical business interruptions like hurricanes. I lived in Florida for a period of time, you know, flooding the blizzards in, in, in the Northeast and uh, Midwest, uh, working through the financial crisis and even, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions that we've handled in our, in our careers. I think we are in a worldwide change, if you will, which is why everybody is so stressed and the pressures of, of that change. But particularly, you know, our HR um, groups and colleagues are really under the pressure of change as new laws have rolled out, which we'll be talking about um, one of those later, policies that um, we are implementing protocols um, around uh, sanitation and disinfection and uh, processes from where we work, how we work, how we're using new technology. Um, then you throw on the stress of homeschooling. None of us uh, thought we'd be teachers uh, and managing a full-time plus job. Um, and then the pressures of uh, our personal uh, lives and major events being canceled. What's happening with graduation? Um, you know, is prom going to occur? Uh, weddings and et cetera. So, you know, I think 
not only do we as uh, professional HR professionals have um, you know the onus on us to lead our organization through um, this unprecedented change, uh, we also have uh, you know our personal lives where we are balancing where we're balancing the new pressures of of, of working from home um, and how do we do that? So you know I think what what the one takeaway is is we need to look for that silver lining. Um, because I think when, where we see some of these challenges and hurdles that we need to overcome and bring our organizations through um, provides that that opportunity. You know, I think we certainly have been challenged. Um, you know, our courage has been challenged. You know, our routines have been challenged. Our optimism and our resiliency have all been challenged and, and, and been tested. But I think in the end, what comes out of it is uh, the opportunity, the opportunity to improve processes, the opportunity to improve culture, uh, the opportunity to improve leadership skills. So I think, you know, this virus um, and pandemic is certainly going to change our everyday lives uh, in the future. I think we are going to, you know, will we ever shake a hand again? I, I, I don't know. I think we're going to see increased work, uh, work from home and remote work. And so this is an opportunity to uh, get our workforce prepared and, re and ready for that. Um, I think there's going to be more focus on uh, cleaning protocols and, you know, how do we um, make sure that uh, we are um, on top of that. So in terms of, you know, understanding those pressures, I think we are really focused on uh, keeping our organizations healthy, keeping ourselves and our, and our households healthy so we can serve the needs of our, our employees and our organizations. Thank you very much, Laura. I know we're definitely going to get into some of that that pre-post planning as we as we move through our conversation today, because that's obviously going to be super important. Um, Lauren, do you want to jump in and talk about what you're dealing with now? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and thank you, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you all today. I hope everyone and their families are doing well. Um, and I agree with everything that Laura just said. You know, in the last four weeks, our lives and our businesses have really dramatically changed. Um, and before all this happened, in a normal work day, even minor changes to our day-to-day -day work lives uh, can add stress. And then you throw in COVID-19 on top of all of that, and we're faced with new challenges that we never even imagined before. Um, I think uh, for me personally, and also probably for all of you, the flow of information can be exhausting. Um, we've been thrust into this different lifestyle in our personal lives, but also there's the added stress as leaders of evaluating the impact that this is having on colleagues, on our customers, and on the business. Um, we've had to implement our pandemic plans, implementing increased safety measures for employees. Uh, we have to adjust to managing remote teams as we have more people working from home. And the administrative piece has been a, a huge burden, just trying to learn and keep up with all of the information coming out and the new regulations. Um, and I think also just the collective anxiety and stress from a personal standpoint and then also from your employee base. Um, as leaders, we have the, we're facing increased stresses, but so are all of our employees. And I think that it's very important that we maintain compassion for the situation that people are in and really um, consider the impact that this is having on our teams and on their families as well. Thank you very much, Lauren. And I know, you know, obviously on our end, on my end personally, you know, we feel the stress as well because, uh, you know, we finally have a week where there hasn't been a new, a new law or a new regulation passed. So it's nice to have a little break from that. But now some of the laws that have been passed are starting to kick into place. So it brings on a whole new, a whole new sort of stress bucket. Um, so Allison, I know we're probably a little bit more used to working remotely, but I know, you know, in talks with you over the last couple of days, things have been, have been pretty crazy as well. Yeah, as we talk about stress here, I am, my blood pressure just rose as I can hear my teenagers in the background uh, Zoom doing a Zoom call with some of their teachers and friends, and I'm petrified that you can hear it. But that is the new norm, right? Trying to balance being a parent, being um, a child, being a grandchild, and working from home. So, uh, in advance, um, I apologize if you hear that, but uh, but you know when you think about it, that's what our employees are experiencing, probably on a greater scale if they have smaller children. Um, you probably heard me say before that I, I joked that if you had told me three years ago I'd 
be able to have the right to take employees' temperatures, I would have thought we were crazy. But here we are, and you'll hear me say it again, it's just, it's just a completely different environment for our families and for um, our workplace. Uh, from the beginning, much of my stress came from just making sure we were doing the right thing by our employees. Um, and doing that while balancing their privacy and business operations. It's like this constant juggling act, and that remains, um, that remains a concern for me. Um, you know, we were trying, we were trying, in the beginning, we tried to balance uh, uh, employees who felt pressured um, to, to work, to come into the um, office, but were nervous and they were scared that they might catch something um, and uh, infect themselves or infect uh, family members. So uh, we had to deal with that right away. Um, and then the, there's just the logistics of getting people to work from home. We have an amazing IT team here um, at Rogers Gray, and um, they just made it happen. But there's a lot of stress that, that comes from that and, and making that happen. But also from the employees' perspective, some of our employees didn't have uh, intranet access. So we had to assist with that and um, trying to get them um, to be successful in um, the work environment, um, the new work environment for them. Uh, and then from uh, the quick implementation um, of the FFCRA, I mean, gosh, that turnaround was so quick in trying to get our payroll system um, up and working. Uh, for tracking purposes and to make sure it was correct and then to communicate to employees this is how we're going to do it. It's just a lot. And um, I'm someone who loves structure. I, I thrive in it. Um, and, and several of my direct reports actually do as well. But here's what the, uh, I've been saying to myself. I've had to say it out loud and I've said it to my employees. Take a deep breath. Um, embrace the fact that there's a ton of unknowns and there's going to be some chaos and just accept it and be more flexible. Try to enjoy and celebrate our successes, even if they're small, and ultimately give myself a break and give uh, my employees and uh, my peers um, the opportunity to exhale and give themselves a break. So that's kind of how I've approached the continuing stress. And I think uh, everyone hit on great topics there. And I think the biggest thing that I've seen is just I think Lauren, you'd mentioned it's just the compassion where it's just, there's a, there's a newfound understanding that not that it not, wasn't necessarily there before, but I think people are much more understanding with that you kids at home. Um, I know I have, no, I think every video conference I've done, one of, one of our animals has made an appearance, you know, not, not intentionally, but um, they've been there. So just understanding, you know, the dynamics of having you know, a potential a spouse that's working at home as well. So trying to, you know, trying to make sure that you respect everyone's everyone's privacy, but trying to make it all work. So I think, you know, I think we're definitely seeing that where there's there's a newfound compassion for everything. Even out on walks, we're seeing everyone's waving. You know, everyone gives each other. You know, there are six feet of social distancing room, et cetera. So um, I think that's, that that was a great way to kind of kick things off and hopefully level set. Everyone can kind of take a deep breath and relax. And um, you know, now we'll get into some of the some of the nitty gritty of, of what our new world looks like. So the next section that we're gonna chat about is communication here. So, and I think with with any type of big issue like this, the pre-planning and, and what you have in place is always is always a great way to, to offset some of the unknown. Um, so do we wanna talk about just a little bit about what, what each organization has done from a pre-planning standpoint to get yourself ready? Laura, do you wanna kick it off again? Certainly. Thanks, Jeff. So, you know, like many organizations, we had a business continuity um, and a disaster recovery and um, uh, somewhat, you know, a pandemic, um, however, really focused on flu. And if we think of what has really occurred worldwide, I don't know if anybody had, you know, a plan in place for something that hit, hit, is hitting the world right now um, and for just a complete shutdown of everything that we knew as normal. So certainly pulling those plans out really early. We, in addition, set up a preparedness committee 
<clears throat> pardon me, and what this preparedness committee um, has been able to do is to put some things in really early because um, we were experiencing um, outbreaks of flu. So uh, pulling out our business continuity, um, who's cross-trained, you know, looking at our matrices, uh, we were able to kind of get ahead of the curve uh, as it relates to the pre-planning for pandemic uh, because we were having outbreaks of, of flu uh, in various facilities. So it allowed us to get in, um, get some deep cleaning uh, protocol set up, um, getting disinfectant wipes in before the pandemic rush for uh, disinfecting wipes and, and such. And so um, that was very helpful um, to the point of being able to then morph our preparedness committee um, into looking um, at how we were going to tackle uh, the challenges that came with the pandemic um, and, and, and the various illness. So looking holistically at the employee, it wasn't necessarily just the employee and, and their illness, uh, it was the employee and their household or their immediate family member or who they have, have come in contact with. So very important that we had um, the skills um, identified for cross-training, uh, that we had um, already on hand materials from a pandemic perspective. We had gloves already in place and et cetera because of uh, our preparedness for what was happening with the flu. So I, I, we've never been in this situation before and uh, I think we have learned a lot, but certainly the pre-planning from a business continuity um, succession planning and pipeline of talent, I think, was uh, really critical to uh, be prepared for the pandemic that we currently are experiencing. Excellent. Thank you very much, Laura. Lauren, do you want to jump in and just talk about some of the things that Rockland has done to get ready for, for these type of situations? Yeah, um, and we also, we had a pretty robust disaster recovery and business continuity plan, which uh, made things go a lot more smoothly. But similar to what Laura just said, you cannot plan for every exact situation. So um, one of the things that we found is that you might have a plan laid out of how you think things are going to work, but it's not going to go exactly according to that plan. So I think we just had to adapt and make adjustments where necessary. Uh, we did also, similar to Laura, we were monitoring the situation closely. So we started talking about this months before, um, you know, the, the March shutdown. Uh, we were seeing what was happening in the news. The leader, leadership started talking about it. Um, I, I guess probably somewhere around January-ish, um, we started doing weekly calls just to update on the situation and asking our business units to take a look at those disaster recovery plans that you have. Is what you put in there when we were doing the exercise last year, is that still accurate? Is that really how it's gonna work um, if we get to a situation where we need to implement this? Um, and I'm so thankful that we did that because of course we needed to implement it. Um, and even though all of the plans might have not worked exactly as we expected, um, we've been able to make adjustments and certainly having that framework in place was a huge help for us. Great, absolutely. And, and Allison, we already, I already mentioned it briefly, but obviously, you know, you would think we would be pretty, uh, at Rogers Gray, ready to go with this since a lot of us, my, myself included, work mostly remotely, but obviously we have, uh, we had our own set of challenges as well. Yeah, the, the saying man plans and God laughs, uh, certainly appropriate. Uh, we did have an emergency and we do have an emergency disaster uh, preparedness committee. It's HRIT, ops, finance, facilities, and marketing. We've had that for years because we've um, prepared for hurricanes and ice storms, and it's always been a working document. But like Laura and Lauren said, there's no way to anticipate the, the idiosyncrasies of a, a pandemic like this. Um, and uh, certainly a large number, a large part of our population, um, employee population, their job is related to client interactions. Um, they see clients on a daily basis, people purchasing cars and needing insurance or purchasing health insurance. These are one-on-one -on -one personal interactions. So um, we hadn't moved most of our workforce 
to uh, remote, but um, we have at this point, and it was just, it was a challenge. Like I said um, earlier, we had an, an employee that didn't have um, internet. We have a couple of employees that don't have smartphones, um, and so we've had to accommodate for that. We deployed Chromebooks um, to our employees who needed them, dual monitors, um, and we've helped set up um, those um, internet connections for those who have uh, struggled there. So now our workforce is remote, and um, the feedback from some of the employees is, I don't ever want to do this again. I love being in the office, but then there's a large uh, amount of our population that'll um, enjoy being uh, working remote in some capacity going forward. Um, like the uh, like Laura and Lauren had said, we um, we were proactive and um, were able to get ahead of some of the um, other organizations, and we were deploying. Uh, gloves, wipes, and sprays to all our offices weeks before um, um, others were. And then when the supply ran low, we actually had one of our employees um, out of our own initiative uh, make a disinfectant based on the CDC guidelines, and we distributed that. And I know employees felt um, grateful and comforted, I think, that we were so proactive in, in advance of that. Uh, and then we also, to take the pressure off, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we told employees who were high risk or who had a high risk person at home, work from home. And we did that from very, very early on. And I think that made a difference. And then um, we opened it up um, as well at the same time to those who just felt concerned. I don't feel comfortable coming in. I'm, I'm not high risk, but I'm just worried go work from home and I think that helped um, to take some of the pressure off um, a lot of our employees which allows them to focus on their families and the work absolutely and, and obviously within this communication um, within this just looking at the slide on here there's obviously a couple different areas to hit we've kind of hit on a couple of them already but you know there's there's that initial adjustment period you know technology security obviously we've heard some of the Everyone's using Zoom now, I think, some of the potential issues with Zoom. Um, you know, the, the bottom two are around fun and, you know, how do you keep some sort of culture? I know a lot of people are doing the, the happy hours on a Friday afternoon. Um, but I think two of, the biggest, two of the biggest questions that I received during the week just through my conversations were, you know, how do you keep some sort of management around it? Obviously, how do you, you know, these are employees, they're still, if you're an essential business and you're still working, uh, the employees need you know, some sort of management, some sort of production management, workflow, et cetera. So um, do we want to speak just a little bit on, you know, maybe we can, we'll talk about the sort of the fun part last, um, but just some of the, some of the adjustments that have needed to be made with, you know, flexibility with your hours. So kids, you know, trying to find daycare solutions for kids and maybe having to work, um, you're, you're different than your typical nine to five or, you know, finding technology solutions that work for you with your clients. You know, Lauren, I know you mentioned something, um, you know, tonality, making sure you're sending the right messages out to people. I think these are all super, super important topics. Um, so would you guys like to just talk about that as far as um, hitting on some of these items here? And we'll kind of save the fun, the fun to last, because I think that's, that's super important with what's going on is to keep some semblance of fun going on. Sure. So, Jeff, I'll I'll be happy to to jump in. Um, you know, very similar in terms of uh, you know the whole technology piece. Um, obviously, as a bank, we're customer facing. We have a lot of concerns around keeping our employees safe um, and uh, making sure that we're sending the right message to um, our employees and our our customers. But what we've done is gone mostly remote. So even our branches and our banking centers aren't fully staffed because we're using uh, drive up uh, services only. That puts an enormous amount of uh, staff that typically is working in our banking centers um, to be able to do other things. And so we have a uh, large mortgage business and then you know we have obviously the most recent small business uh, loans that uh, activated earlier in the week and so what we've done is we have uh, redeployed um, our our talent to help in the areas that have um, extreme workloads right now um, 
So from a productivity perspective, what we've done, they don't need to be lending experts. We've broken down our processes into such small learnable tasks that it's, um, that it's allowed our employees that perhaps don't have lending experience be able to assist in the workflow of the lending process. And so we have equipped everybody with laptops. Some of them have dual monitors. Uh, we had to switch our VPN uh, service because we didn't have enough licenses. And so we uh, went to a different VPN model. So everybody has VPN. Similar challenges that uh, Allison spoke to about uh, not everybody surprisingly had Wi-Fi at home. We do have several users that are flip phones. Um, and so making accommodations there uh, so they have the necessary tools to be able to assist in um, different areas of the bank. And at this point, I'm pleased to say I have all but two um, that are actually working in other areas um, and assisting uh, on the workflow and the various processes that are happening around our lending. Um, and soon I'll have uh, those two also uh, working. So I think, you know, you combine the technology, um, the right message, you know, employees want to be engaged and feel that they're helping. Uh, and they know that uh, the works in the banks right now are um, have a lot of work going on, and so they want to be product. product uh, pardon me, that they want to be productive, and so uh, they are very willing and are very uh, anxious to help in other areas of the bank. So it's not necessarily uh, watching every hour that they're working, because certainly being flexible across. Uh, a work from home platform uh, has its challenges with kids being home and you know getting lunch on the table and school and uh, etc. So we have done a lot with rolling out tools for our managers on how to manage a remote work team and uh, tools for our employees on how do you work remotely because you've not done it before. So those are just a few things that, that we've done in terms of uh, managing productivity uh, sending the right message and engaging our workforce. Yeah, Laura, I um, I think a lot of similar things are happening at Rockland Trust. Um, obviously, we are an essential business as well, so we do have to keep our branches open. Um, we're doing drive up and limited branch hours, but we do have employees working in the office. And I'd say probably estimate about 30% are working from home. But whether employees are working in the office or working from home, one of the biggest issues is that childcare issue. Um, all of the daycares are closed. People don't want to bring a babysitter into their house because they're fearful. And they don't know if they're going to be bringing in a virus that then makes their children sick. Um, so that's a really scary thing for people and probably one of the most frequent anxieties that we're hearing from our employees. Um, I think it's really, really important to be as flexible as possible. Um, I think partial days are better than no hours at all. So if you're able to flex an employee's hours to accommodate their schedules, do that. Um, we do have on my team, I know we typically have people working like an 8.30 to 5 schedule. We have people working 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then jumping on later from 1 to 5 or working later nights when they can trade off with a spouse. Um, just to kind of help them be able to adapt and um, make sure their kids are cared for. Um, we also have, we've been lucky that our uh, HRIS platform, we operate on Oracle, it has a social feature. So they have these chat boards that we have set up where um, we created one just for employees who are struggling with this issue. And it's kind of, we've let it take on, it's, uh, you know, we've let it kind of go on its own, not really moderating it. But really, it's become a board where employees can just go and empathize with one another. They're providing resources for one another on home learning or daycare alternatives or ways to keep kids busy during the day. Um, and I think, you know what, if I know someone else mentioned, Allison, maybe it was you, you got your kids uh, screaming in the background or making noise. Um, I think that that happens a lot now. And it's being understanding that if you're on a conference call and there's a lot of background noise going on or you're on a Zoom call and you see a child jumping into the screen, um, you know what, it, it's the new norm. And uh, I think being as understanding as possible for people is really important. Um, also, I'll speak a little bit to, uh, to sending the right message. Um, this has been something we've talked about a lot at Rockland Trust, um, and 
acknowledging that this time is difficult for everyone is really important. Not everyone's experience is going to be exactly the same as someone else, but everyone is faced with increased challenges right now. We need to be honest. Um, be honest about what you can do as an organization. Be empathetic to your employees. And they're, you know, they're going through a stressful time. Their spouse might be laid off. They have the child care issues going on. They're trying to balance their new work life and getting things done. Um, you need to make sure your communications are genuine and honest with employees. But also review any other maybe unrelated content that you have planned to send out. Is it still relevant to really send that right now? If it is, is the tone of the email considerate of what's currently going on? I've received a couple emails, um, you know, from outside sales or vendors or something that doesn't acknowledge any of that and it almost comes across as a little bit tone deaf. So you just want to be careful of that. Of course, we still need to run the business and there's going to be emails that we need to send to get things done and keep things going. But just make sure you, you give it a once over, you read it through and make sure that it's still appropriate to send out right now. Yeah, and Lauren, I think that's that's super, super important just to make sure that, you know, understanding the position everyone's in, that sending the right message is probably, um, I think, arguably one of the most important things, just not only internally with your own employees, but externally with customers as well. Um, I know that's that's super, super important. Um, Allison, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Rogers Gray with some of this stuff? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, my concern remains uh, for our uh, families trying to work at home. As Lauren said, we have spouses that have been laid off and uh, we have children at home while we're trying to uh, get our work done and it's a lot of pressure. And you can't be everything to everyone and that has remained our message. Do what you can and we'll provide you the uh, support, resources, tips and tricks to um, help you be successful in uh, being a, a parent, being uh, a remote employee. Um, and it's all about communication between the employee and the manager. Having a relationship where they can say, listen, I'm, I'm stressed. I can't work from 10 to 12 every day. That's when my child is at their peak, peak um, um, level of energy and I need to be off. And that's just a, a conversation that we have, we've kind of always had, um, but becomes a lot more relevant now. With our uh, remote desktop, re desktop, excuse me, our remote desktop, any one of our team members can replicate their system at home. It looks just like it does in the workplace. Um, so I think that allows them to feel that continuation at home. Um, additionally, our agency uh, management system, any one of our service people can jump into a client and provide support if someone else is unable to do it. And we have layers of um, su uh, service support so um, that for those who work directly with the clients, they have uh, layers on, um, beneath them uh, working collaboratively to um, support the client. Uh, we have our receptionist on a um, integrated uh, switchboard which allows them to jump in and off calls um, when um, when another receptionist is, is busy, and that's been really, really helpful. Uh, we've used an intranet for years, um, and that has become, that has always been a repository for our agency processes, procedures, and common documents. So we don't have a lot of paper at um, our desk, so employees can um, get their their um, their forms, uh, be reminded of trainings all through our internet, and I think that's super helpful too. We push notifications that way, and they can access it from home um, as well, um, outside of the system if they're on their phone, so it allows them to have a little more um, control over the information. In some of our departments, we've shifted duties. Um, my department had to adjust. I have two, I have three, um, employees that have um, small children, and so we just shift duties. We have co uh, conversations, and um, we have to decide not to pursue a project right now, or we push off a deadline by commute with uh, good communication. We've accommodated family schedules, as I mentioned uh, numerous times already. We have um, employees that sometimes work four hours in the morning and then four hours at night. Um, I would say that with the um, addition of the FFCRA and the um, 
the tax credit for employer uh, for employers, we were very transparent with that. We're paying it 100% at this point, regardless if you have any any one of the six qualifying reasons. Um, but uh, that lead tracking, uh, we were honest and said, listen, do what you can. But if you can't work, then track that time so um, that we can receive that benefit. And it may sound um, that may sound a little rough, but I think we're honest with it. And I actually think it took some pressure off our employees. I had an employee say to me, I actually feel better. I feel less guilty about taking an hour off each day um, related to my kids so, uh, uh, because I can track that time. And I know that uh, Rogers Gray receives some benefit out of that, even though I can't work for that hour. So um, kind of a strange dynamic there. Yes. And then so I, before we get into the benefit part, I know Allison, I, Lauren, you had mentioned Oracle. Allison, I know you, you, we were talking yesterday about, you know, taking advantage of, of Ben Admin type platforms right now. But what about funds? So what's everyone doing to try to keep things a little bit light and loose? I know internally at Rogers Grow, we had, for those that know John Turco, he did a comedy show through Zoom the other night. It was fantastic. Um, what's everyone doing to try to keep things a little bit light and fun right now? Um, this is Lauren. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think now more than ever, people are looking for some morale booster. Um, we send out weekly stress tips to our employees um, with just some resources like the EAP resources and information on staying active during all of this. Um, so those things are all great, but we're also doing some fun team building stuff as well. I know a lot of people have been doing um, things through Zoom meetings and building activities. One of my coworkers discovered an app, uh, I don't know if any of you have tried it, it's called House Party, where you can actually, it's kind of like a Zoom meeting video, you can jump on, you can play games like Pictionary. Um, so we're gonna be trying that within the HR team. Um, but Laura mentioned, I think uh, in her intro, there's a lot of things going on right now. People are kind of in the stage of grief over many things that they had planned for and they thought they were going to celebrate that are now canceled, like a graduation or um, this happens to be within my HR group, a really busy month for birthdays. Um, and we used to celebrate them in the office. We would, you know, pass around a card, everyone would sign it. And now that most of us are remote, we've had to get really creative with that. Um, and one of my colleagues actually found a website um, where you can do group e-birthday cards. So um, you send out a link and everyone in the department can sign it. You can switch up the font to make it look like it's handwriting. You can add emojis. Um, and we've been doing that just to kind of acknowledge, um, you know, the birthday because we don't want to cancel it. The birthday isn't canceled just because we're all not in the office. Um, and I think also just saying thank you to employees for everything they're doing is a real morale booster. People need to hear that. They need to um, feel like all their efforts that they're doing during this time are being recognized. So important just to say thank you for everything that they're doing. Um, and the only other thing I would add here, if you are organizing, um, you know, any type of a group activity or fun team building thing, um, just be conscious that it might not be for everyone. Um, I have a really good friend that uh, is currently working from home. She has uh, an 18 month old son. Her and her spouse are both working from home right now. And uh, she got a request from leadership at her company to join a Zoom meeting the other day. And it happened to be at the same time that her husband had a business meeting. And then they also have their son to care for. So they discussed it together and they decided that, you know what, he would cancel his meeting and she would log into the Zoom meeting so that she could attend that. When she logged in, she realized that it was actually just a team building event where they were doing like a fun activity, talking about um, their childhood and they had to draw a picture or something. And she said, you know what? I know it was really well intentioned from them. Like they were trying to get everyone together and boost everyone's spirits, but that actually caused so much more stress for me because I realized my husband had to cancel his meeting, his client meeting, he canceled. And I was now, felt like I was just wasting my time being on this. And I wish that I had had a heads up beforehand that that's what was going to take place. And I wish they had given me an option not to attend. Um, so I think just keep in mind, if you are, are scheduling those things, it's great. And for many people, they are going to really want that. But also give people an out. Um, you know, they might be struggling with other things. They might have things going on where they're not able to attend. 
And that's okay if they need to pass on that. It's not necessarily for everyone. Well, I noticed some great ideas. I actually wrote down a number of them, and I can really appreciate the um, your friend who said, "I, I, if I had known what the uh, agenda was, or I understand, or I had an opt out, that um, I would have done that." I, and I think that's one of the challenges with doing a lot of these things is, you know, um, the intention is so um, good. It's, it comes from a, a positive place, but uh, trying to be everything to everyone. I'm going to try to do this happy hour. I got to. I also have to attend this client meeting, and then I have to feed the baby and put him down for nap, and I have to do shopping. I, I just think it's a lot, and so I think really reiterating um, the opt out and the communication between the employee and manager is super super important. Um, we've been doing happy hours. They're all voluntary, um, and um, they've been a lot of fun. Um, Mike and Dave Robinson, um, our two owners, sent out handwritten thank you notes to everyone um, at their home stating how awesome they are and why they're appreciated. Um, our marketing team with help uh, from information from our, our IT department, HR, uh, and um, some other departments that um, provide some guidance, they sent out a daily update. And so you worry about over communicating, but uh, our marketing department is so fun uh, that they make it really creative and have made it really light so it's not burdensome to read it. Um, you actually look forward to it and the feedback is great. Our marketing team also created a uh, Facebook Rogers Gray team for just employees and we're sharing pictures, jokes, uh, videos of our activities with our families, just words of encouragement and I think that has um, um, been so um, helpful for a lot of our employees. Mothers with uh, kids hanging off their hips and trying to attend um, a, a conference call can really uh, relate to uh, seeing that uh, from their coworkers. Um, the birthday and celebrations, it makes me so sad to think that um, a lot of our children are, are missing out on those group activities. So we're, we're participating as much as possible in drive-by birthdays. Did one in the rain yesterday. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I think it's a, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it supports our employee community. Um, our, we have an engagement task force as well as a wellness club, all employee driven, all managed by employees. And um, they put together a schedule of activities and challenges, all optional, all voluntary. I'm going to make sure I, re I reinforce that. We have a dance-off uh, video uh, posting right now. Uh, Lynn Mason Small, our CMO, and her um, son did a, a, a nice little hip-hop TikTok um, dance, which was fun. Um, and we have some family activities and challenges, crafts and dance parties and um, karaoke going on. Uh, we also have a, a wellness bingo that's focused on physical and mental health, like stand up and walk around, step away from your desk, check that box. There's a lot of stuff, all optional, all voluntary, but it's um, it's been helpful to keep everybody engaged, I think, in that way. And if I could jump in, there are two things that we have recently um, rolled out that um, you know, around the whole wellness and, uh, you know, the mindfulness. Uh, so we rolled out a an app um, that to the entire organization that is allows for group exercise, you know, on your on your phone. And it it allows them to track what they're eating. It has um, meditation. It has, um, you know, yoga and weights and um aerobic and running and, and et cetera. And so our employees are able to do group exercise um, through their phone or even, pardon me, even their, their laptop. Last year as an organization, we went through a program um, around mindset. And so we have rolled out um, exercises and activities for our employees to be able to use some of those tools with their family uh, from a, you know, mental health and stress is uh, really, uh, under attack right now. So giving them all of the tools, uh, coping mechanisms and managing stress um, has been really important. And we have that up on our, our intranet or our hub that we call it. 
We also have uh, last year launched um, mentoring circles and these are peer to peer circles. And we have stood up um, just recently since we've gone to this work from home uh, platform, a mentoring circle around working from home. And so it is a group of employees that um, get together every other week and discuss uh, the challenges and the tools and the hints and the tricks. Um, and what we're doing is calling those ideas out and getting them out on our internet for our employees to be able to more widely use. Uh, we're also standing up a new mentoring circle around um, you know, parenting and schooling at home. So although we have resources on our internet for activities to do with um, the kids at home and, and how to balance work life, um, getting together a group of new moms uh, to talk about uh, what their challenges are and how are they coping and how are they getting uh, through. So that peer-to-peer -peer connection, we fortunately rolled out Microsoft Teams um, right we're in the process of rolling it out and had many pilot groups up on Microsoft Teams prior to uh, sending everybody home to work from home. And that has really allowed uh, the whole video uh, conferencing tools. And so they're able to connect, uh, you know, people are showing, you know, they're, you know, to Allison's point, uh, you know, the uh, employee with the child on the hip or the dog bothering them to get dinner because uh, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, which would be my household. Um, you know, and, and kind of bringing people, frankly, now into their homes, which is now their, their workplace. So those are a couple of things that not only help us continue with our corporate, corporate culture, um, but employees have found very engaging and fun to help with the whole work-life balance. And yeah, those absolutely. are all awesome I, ideas. Oops, sorry, I was just going to ask a quick question. So we had a couple of questions pop up here. Um, more for advice for those, those organizations that might not have as robust of an HR department, what would be your advice for, for maybe doing some of these, like a, you know, a Facebook group is easier, cards going out to employees could be something. What would be the advice for, for an organization that might not necessarily have all of the resources of a, you know, a full large HR team, but just to try to do something for their employees along these lines. So one of the ideas, oh, okay. oh, ahead, well, you know, one idea is even for birthdays to do not only the um, e-cards uh, that Lauren had talked about, but you can do e-gift cards to Amazon and right now, frankly, about anywhere. Um, so small tokens, you know, Dunkin' Donuts um, and et cetera, just to recognize and stay in touch and, and, and communicate. So, you know, I think we have all risen from, you know, into larger organizations. I know I was the sole HR person, um, payroll benefits, the whole thing for, uh, you know, an organization really early in my career. And I think back on how do we bring and engage our, our employees and some of it is linking them with each other, with their peers. Um, and in this time, it really is staying in, in, in touch with them, uh, whether that's through email, through, through Skype, through a webcam, uh, whether it's uh, Facebook and giving them an outlet. I love the idea that Lauren had on the whole chat uh, and Microsoft Teams allows us to do that. We haven't done that. And I, I love the idea of them being able to connect and share uh, their experiences and, and their family, you know, what's happening in, in their household that, that is now their work. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add, um, you know, Rockland Trust is obviously a larger organization. We have over 1,400 employees um, in 100 branch locations. Um, but we're, so we've been all separated out. We, so we had a, um, actually a communication newsletter called Rock Talk that we would use to kind of keep, before any of this happened, use to keep people in tune with what's going on with everyone else because we're working at separate locations. With a smaller organization, you might have been used to working all together, but now you are working at separate locations. So I think that communication is key. Um, and even just highlighting some of the things that your colleagues are doing. I know many, um, many people are sewing masks. Um, we had some employees who were organizing drives for the local food pantry. And just highlighting those to the other colleagues and communicating it out 
really can kind of reinforce that corporate culture that we're all in this together and people are, in light of all the bad news that we're hearing every day, there's a lot of good going on within the company. Um, so when you hear those things, the, the great things that your employees are doing in the community, share them out with everyone. I think uh, it's always something that people want to see. Great, thank you very much. And so we're we're coming close to the close of communication. I wanted to just I know Allison, we had chatted yesterday about uh, you know now if you if you haven't taken advantage of a benefits administration type system, now might be a good time to do that to help you know communicate with with a remote workforce. Do you want to spend a minute on that just before? I do want to get to the administration part because I know there are a lot of questions on you know how do how do we make sure our organizations are set up to handle all of all the new things that are going on. But Allison, do you want to just spend a minute on, on that, the benefits communication part? Well, let me back up by saying, uh, if you are the only HR person in your, in your company or you don't have HR um, in your company, give yourself a break. Take a deep breath. We've all been there. Do what you can uh, within the, um, the, the scope of your organization. Um, a couple keys. I'm gonna. I'll get to the Ben Adam in a second, Jeff. Sorry. Um, uh, empower your leadership team to uh, interact um, to uh, support their employees. So, um, getting your teams to do Zoom, but with the video, I think it makes a huge difference to see gestures and expressions and make um, uh, virtual eye contact. Um, we have a, a two text. Um, groups for our um, one for our employees only and one for our employees and their families. That's been a great way to easily push information out there, push contests, um, just uh, push well um, well wishes and good feelings out there. Uh, it's been pretty um, well received. As I mentioned earlier, the Facebook um, uh, the Facebook page specifically for Rogers Glee employees has been super super help, uh, helpful um, and it's easy to set up. Um, when I talk about empowering your leadership, um, we've spoken to our employee, uh, our managers, and said, "Hey, listen, if you hear that someone's struggling right now, like their spouse is laid off, or they're alone in their house, do something. Send a meal, um, send some wine, send some paper products, do something." Uh, and our, our managers know to do that already, but this is a, a saying. Listen. No holds bar, really. Just go and do it and do what feels good for you, for that employee. Um, internally, we have a head shaving um, contest right now started by Dave Robinson, who did not officially buzz his whole head, by the way. Um, uh, we're, our, we, Rogers Gray will uh, contribute to local food pantries uh, on and off Cape uh, for our employees and their families who shave their heads. Um, so that's been kind of fun and um, been pushed along a lot by our, our employees. So um, those are just some key things. But l like I said when I started, give yourself a break. And Jeff, this is not probably the best time to roll out a Ben Admin. Um, and um, it, it's a good idea. We've, we've had it for a number of years. It allows employees to enroll um, via their uh, mobile phone, via the website. Um, and it takes the pressure off HR for collecting paper. Uh, you can also do push notifications. Um, you can store benefit documents. Um, some of the systems actually allow you to take little videos um, of uh, benefit information. Um, but it's definitely been really, really helpful. And I would encourage employers to look at that in the next few months as a part of your um, business continuity plan. Um, but Probably right now is not the best time to take on a new project like that. Um, and I would say that in related to benefits, we rolled out um, telehealth about two or three years ago. Uh, Rogers Gray pays for it, and there's always been a copay um, attached to it uh, for the usage. And um, this year, we actually took the copay off um, for the employees. And it does two things. It allows employees to access mental health, urgent care, um, and even um, some preventative and um, regular office visits and allows them to do that 24-7, 
um, with uh, physicians and actually get prescriptions that way, but it also drives claims off our health plan to, um, st uh, it limits the amount of time someone goes to an emergency for non-urgent reasons. So um, that in connection with our Ben Admin, I, um, I think has been uh, two key takeaways from this situation. Yeah, I think we're we're definitely seeing it on our side of the business where any kind of sweeping changes right now, um, it, it's just not in the cars. But yeah, definitely something for a, a post planning. Um, so I just want to let everyone know. So in the in the chat box, uh, we just sent out that e card, the website. So it's www.groupgreetings.com. So if anyone wants to take advantage of that, um, that is the website for there. I think that's probably a pretty good time to kick over to the next section of the presentation. So administration. So I know Lauren, we had talked a bunch about this yesterday. Do you want to kick kick off the, the pre-planning part? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, it, I know we talked a little bit earlier about having a disaster recovery plan, and it's great if you had a really robust plan in place. Um, but if you did not have a great plan in place, it's not too late now to take steps to get in front of some of the administrative challenges that we're all still going to face. Um, you need to be planning now for the worst case scenario so that you aren't scrambling at the last minute. Some of you may already have been faced with having an employee who um, tested positive for COVID-19. Um, do you have a procedure in place uh, of what you're going to do if you do have an employee who tests positive? Do you have communications prepared? Um, time is of the essence in that situation, so you want to have everything done ahead of time and hope that it doesn't happen, but plan like it will. Um, do you have cleaners lined up? I know that Laura said that earlier, um, early on in their disaster recovery planning, they had kind of um, lined up deep cleaning services. Um, if you have an employee that tests positive, you're gonna have to clean the location. Do you know who's gonna do that for you? Are they equipped to do that? And how much notice do they need? And how much time is it gonna be before your employees can get back in? Um, obviously, that's for businesses that are essential and still running in the office. But even if you're 100% at home still, we're all having to go out to the grocery store or, um, you know, just being out in society, and employees can get sick at any moment. Um, so it's really important to understand what are your critical roles and do you have a backup plan if you have an employee that has to go out? Um, I manage personally two really critical functions at Rockland Trust. I oversee the payroll team uh, and the benefits team, which handles leaves of absence, which are very critical right now. So we've really had to discuss what happens if my payroll manager gets sick and can't work um, or my benefits manager can't work. Who is the backup and is that person trained to handle all the critical duties that they would need to do? Um, and you know what, what happens if the backup gets sick? Um, what am I going to do if that happens? So we've kind of gone through all of the different scenarios and worked our way down to what is going to be the actual worst case. If we have most of the team out and no one is able to do this, how are we going to pay our employees? Um, and how are we going to get through it? So I would challenge all of you, if you haven't started having those conversations, you need to be um, now just to prepare ahead of time. Um, and, um, you know, making sure that you have um, the systems in place to be able to do it, rely on your vendors. So if you feel like you have um, a smaller company and, you know, if a couple employees get sick, you're not going to be able to complete your critical functions, what can your vendors do for you? The people that process your payroll, can they be um, on, on uh, standby to just run the previous payroll or um, run it based on a scenario that you've given them for a worst case? Um, make those phone calls now and get them in place for, uh, you know, a situation that hopefully never happens, but um, could. And if I can jump in on a couple of things that um, Lauren just said, you know, early on in part of um, our planning was to identify those essential functions and split those work groups up uh across our our footprint so for payroll for example you know our our payroll team sits in a single operations center um together uh in a in in a suite and so early on in the process and part of our planning was from a contingency perspective we split them up we left um you know one in orleans we put one in hyannis we put one up in plymouth um and so a, 
um, if one got sick, they all didn't get sick. Uh, B, it already was a transition step to moving to that work from home because they weren't sitting right next to each other. So it, it eased that transition um, of, of isolation, if you will, even uh, working from home. So that was one thing that I would strongly recommend um, organizations to look at is where are those uh, critical folks and are they all sitting next to each other? We moved the, the leadership team apart um, and sent some to work from home early on, some went to other uh, facilities, but really planning on making sure that you've got that contingency. And as Lauren said, leveraging your vendors, uh, certainly having something in place where if you had to, you could ask ADP or your payroll processing organization to just run less payroll run. Um, having those types of agreements in place with your vendors can assist in you know, a thousand ways when we're in situations like a pandemic that something we've never experienced before. Great, Th thank you very much, Laura. So what about jumping into the, the planning for the end? So on the back end, I know I've gotten a lot of conversations about bringing employees back. What, what are the steps that you're planning on taking you know, for that, that re-assimilation back into the workplace? Wow, so you would think it would just be a simple unwind. <laughs> so what did we do? And then just kind of pull the thread and, and, and unwind it. And, and I really don't think it's going to be that simple. You know, some of the things that we're looking at and um, I, you know, I think Allison mentioned, you know, taking the temperatures of your employees. We currently aren't doing that, but I think as we slowly move back into our work environments, um, that, you know, taking the temperature of our employees as they enter our, any of the bank buildings, um, you know, the continuation of using gloves and um, face masks and, and social distancing. Um, I think continuing with the guidance that we provided our employees that they need to be uh, post uh, symptom free um, 24 hours before they return to work, along with um, you know their household. Um, we did put in a pandemic uh, pay plan uh, for employees that were impacted by childcare, personally. Um, uh, got ill or had other reasons uh, that they had to self-quarantine. So certainly looking at um, sunsetting uh, that that pandemic plan and um, you know moving to accrued time uh, that the employees have earned over the course of their employment. Um, we've put in some uh, temporary pay uh, considerations um, and looking at when is the right time to sunset those. Um, similar to other uh, financial institutions where drive up only. So how do we roll roll back into um, lobby services? I think probably, you know, the first step would be by appointment only uh, and then moving into more general population. Do we look at how do we redesign our, our banking centers and how we operate from a social distancing perspective? We've got, as I said, a lot of employees currently out on temporary assignments. We've loaned out our employees all over the organization to support where we have high volume. And so um, identifying those that are um, critical in the workflow process to meet the needs of the customer and then slowly um, reassigning them back into their um, home department, if you would. But I think things that are going to remain the same is I think initially, um, we're going to continue to very closely track absences and, and very closely tra track travel um, and HR monitoring and um, staying in close contact with employees um, around health, their health, their household health, and um, as they do start to travel. And then certainly then what, what's the essential team that should then start returning back into our other operations buildings? and the things that need to be considered there. Uh, we have um, a cafe in, in our corporate building. So thinking about how then do we ramp back up our, our corporate building um, in terms of other services that we provide out of that building. And I think, you know, every organization, you know, when you are considered essential and you've got uh, people that are going that extra mile, um, you know, are there spot awards that should should be made? Recognizing that there is a huge 
financial impact to organizations at this time. I'm not sure what's going to be happening with the economy and how it's and how it's going to uh, respond and rebound. But it, retention of uh, essential and key employees uh, and certainly the recognition of those that have um, made it through all the bumps and uh, uh, work from home hurdles and you know have given it their all and have managed special projects because we know there's lots of those going on you know how do we recognize them you know and then lastly i would say we need to look at every requisition that we have and evaluate the staffing levels in each work group i think um, every organization that has pushed their workforce to remote uh, has found some efficiencies whether it's going paperless um, and whether it's a process that's been improved uh, so that evaluation of uh, staffing levels from a worker perspective, um, understanding what our essential requisitions are for uh, a go forward basis. So those are just kind of, I think, as we look to unwind and to re-engage back into our work environment uh, and away from uh, our home environment are some of the things that I think we, we will be looking at. But I just don't think it's going to be as simple as uh flipping a switch and we say on monday everybody report back um to the office um that's i i just i don't see that happening um i think our, our as i said in my opening uh, statements i think um, the world that we um had in 2019 is is a far different world than what we're facing and what we will be facing going into the future and i think there's lots of positives and opportunities that are coming out of that um but those are some of the things i think that we're we're looking at yeah i, I think yeah, we, we I, all wholeheartedly totally, agree yeah i agree ahead, Laura. Laura. i was just gonna um i was just gonna add that you know it, it's so hard to predict um, what the end of this is going to look like for all of us. It's such a gray area. And when is that even going to be? But if we just wait until, you know, Charlie Baker comes on and tells us May 4th, whether this is going to be extended or not, if we wait to talk about all of these questions until that point, um, it's going to be more of a challenge. So I think all of those things that Laura just laid out are conversations, even if we don't have an exact answer right now, it's conversations we need to be having right now, anticipating what this could potentially look like, um, you know, as we start opening things back up. Great. And as far as I know, I had chatted with a couple people that had asked about handbook updates for policies, procedures, et cetera. Is there any advice that we can give out there just to make sure you know, I, I, I know I have been way more involved in any HR conversations than I ever had in the past, just with paid family leave coming last year and now all of this this year. So, you know, some of my, my clients that didn't have their handbook maybe all the way on the up and up, um, really the end of this year is kind of, you might as well have it ready to go then. So are there, is there any advice just to make sure that from a, from a policy procedure standpoint, just to get everyone in tip top shape now, is there any advice for anyone? I, I have one piece of advice, and that would be document what your procedure is today. So, you know, I think we are put in some extraordinary circumstances and that what may have been some, a procedure or policy that we have followed to the T uh, before pandemic, we have modified to fit the needs of where we are today. And I think critically important particularly for bankers uh, and from an audit process is to document today what changes were made to the process, whether it was in the workflow, whether it was you know, a procedure, uh, whether you didn't do a step or you added a step, but to document that. So as we come out of this, you can determine whether that was a uh, long-term decision and needs to be built in or whether you actually sunset how you now are doing it and going back to the way that you did do it. Again, I go back to, I think it's an opportunity now to look at all of our processes uh, when we have a moment to breathe, when we're not serving our employees, but to uh, document any changes that you've made and then evaluate, is this a change that we want going forward or was this really only a temporary change? But I think from an audit perspective, uh, having something documented that you've made a change for a temporary period because of the pandemic um, is, you know, uh, it protects you, it protects your employees, and I, I think is critical, and then gives you that platform for 
the future on what policies or procedures are we going to change uh, for um, you know 2021. Excellent. So I know this has been a super hot topic right now, um, coming from from really every angle with with clients or anyone that I'm chatting with. So as far as so now that we have all these new leave rules, um, and I know obviously Laura and Lauren, your companies aren't necessarily subject to the FFCRA, but um, it sounds like you guys have already started to put. I know Lauren, you mentioned something about your own internal tracking mechanism, which could potentially be helpful for people that, that maybe their payroll company isn't quite ready for it yet. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, about how you're tracking all of this, this leave type of stuff? Yeah, we actually, so we have um, ADP as our payroll processor, but our HRIS system is Oracle. Um, and uh, our time card is through Oracle. And it is pretty customizable. So we were able to actually create um, paid time off codes um, or even non-paid time off codes, depending on the situation, that we could code specifically as COVID related. And then we were able to get granular enough where people could actually pick um, a specific reason. So are they, is the um, COVID reason because they're sick or is it a family member sick or are they out due to childcare issues um, or are they out due to anxiety because they don't wanna come into the office because they're fearful. Um, so we have been able to track that way, which has been great. Um, and we've set up a report, so we're able to pull daily a report of the absences um, and report that back to our executive team. Um, and that gives us a lot of information so that we know who is available and working in our workforce, where we have spots that look like, um, you know, we have a lot of people out that might need some extra attention. And I would say to the extent possible that you might have a system that, that does it, um, try and utilize that. Um, also, I think, Laura, you may have mentioned that you're doing something that's a little bit more um, homegrown outside of a system, but even like if, if you have Excel spreadsheets where you can track absences and things that are being reported to you, it's important to be able to identify why people are out um, and who is out so that you can plan appropriately and, um, you know, track those absences. So, yes, uh, Laura, we're using uh, Smartsheet which is a, a free app um, similar to Excel, but it allows our, our managers to report on a, in, on a daily basis. We've asked all of our managers to report their absences um, by nine o'clock in the morning. So we can take a look at um, what is happening to our workforce in terms of, of illness, either their personal illness or a, a family member, et cetera. So we can reach out to them also make sure that we've got coverage uh, in particular work areas, whether we need to do deep cleaning because we've had an illness in the facility, uh, et cetera. So it gives us kind of real time instead of waiting for uh, people to drop their time into the payroll system, uh, at, which is, you know, uh, at best every two weeks. Uh, it gives us um, some internal tracking uh, that we have real time that we can get right on it um, with uh, the manager, reach out to the employee, um, et cetera. So that, that's really been very, very helpful is, is getting ahead of this um, well before it would be reported in, in a time reporting system. And Allison, I think you, did you mention that we're having almost some self-reporting from employees where, you know, they're just kind of keeping track of, of when they are and when they aren't working with childcare, et cetera? Right, so we use Paylocity. So before the code was set up, uh, we had created a spreadsheet that I, uh, allowed them to choose one of the six uh, qualifying reasons and to track the amount of time per day that was non-worked. Uh, so we started that, but now we're able to do that in Paylocity. Um, it can trigger whether it's for themselves, it can trigger for the dependent, um, it can um, track exact um, minutes, uh, so it allows for that intermittent um, period, which would allow the employee to work to some capacity, but not full capacity, um, and that's been super helpful in um, managing this. Okay, excellent. Um, so I think that hits on a lot of the topics for here. So paperwork, I know, has been um, has been a little bit of a hot topic. 
Um, Jen, so I know you're on the phone here. Is have have they had any guidance on best practices for, you know, when it comes to tax credits on the back end, or or what they're what the the state is going to be looking for in order to get those tax credits done? Yes. Yeah, so I want to provide some information that I think will be helpful to the listeners relative to the DOL regulations that relate to record keeping for the FFCRA and also information from the IRS that relates to record keeping for the FFCRA in order to obtain the tax credits. I think both of those uh, agencies have given some good information for employers as to record keeping. So let's talk a little bit about first the DOL and what they're stating. So what they say is that an employer may require employees to follow reasonable notice procedures. So again, you can require employees notify you when they need leave under the FFCRA. And they are stating that the employee must provide a signed statement containing the employee's name, the date for which leave is requested, the coronavirus qualifying reason for the leave, and a statement that the employee can't work or telework because of this reason. So it may be that HR professionals want to create a form that follows the DOL's suggested guidelines as far as what the employee is to provide. And you could provide the employee with that form. They could then sign it because, again, the DOL has said that the employee must provide a signed statement containing those four items. So I think right. that's and Jen, very just helpful. so just so everyone knows on the call, we actually have a uh, we're going to have something that we're including with the presentation afterwards that actually has a sample form in there that hits all those. So if you didn't get all that info down, we actually included with the recording afterwards. We're going to send out um, it's a it's a FFCRA frequently asked questions document, but the last page of it or one of the last pages is a sample form that you can use. So we will have that going out to everyone. That's fantastic. So the the DOL has also said an employee must provide the name of the government entity that issued the quarantine or isolation order to which the employee is subject. Again, I'm not sure this is as important as the other items that are on that list because you all, unless you live under a rock, you know what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is doing, you know what other states are doing as far as the isolation orders or the stay-at-home advisories. So you can certainly request that information, but it is generally known to the public. I think that that may come into play down the road in the event that the or the advisory is lifted, the essential uh, businesses can resume working, and then there could be instances where one city or town decides to have a quarantine if there's an outbreak in that area. So that might be something that comes into play down the road. But right now, I think we're all familiar with what Massachusetts is doing and what many other states are doing. So that's not as much of a concern from my perspective. The employee seeking leave because he or she is self-quarantined must provide the name of the health care provider making that recommendation. And then someone caring for a person who is quarantined must provide either the government entity that issued the quarantine order or the health care provider that's advising the individual to self-quarantine. So again, they're really giving you guidance on what you can and cannot ask for. With regard to the expanded family medical leave, the DOL has said that the employee must provide the name of the child being cared for, the name of the school child care provider that is closed or unavailable due to coronavirus reasons, and a statement representing that no other suitable person is available to care for the child during the period of requested leave. So I think that's very important as well. I've had employers ask me, well, what if I know that there was already a stay-at-home parent and then this person's also asking for this leave? So again, they're going to have to sign a statement representing that there's no one else available to care for the child. So th those are some good guidelines that the Department of Labor has issued and I think they're very helpful. As far as the IRS guidance, that relates to obtaining the tax credit under the FFCRA. The IRS has said that eligible employers claiming the tax credits must retain records and documentation relating to and supporting each employee's leave to substantiate the claims and the, for the credit. And what they do is they have very similar uh, information that they're requesting that 
is in line with the, what the Department of Labor is requesting. So my suggestion is to use one form that will help on the Department of Labor side, but it will also substantiate the tax credit side as well. They're also saying that you're going to have to retain the Form 941s, which are your quarterly federal tax returns, and Form 7200, which is advance of employer credits due to COVID-19, that's a new tax form, and any other applicable filings made to the IRS. So they're, they're asking you to provide the employee's name, the date for the leave, the statement, a statement for the reason the, that the leave is requested, and a statement from the employee that they're unable to work or telework. So it's, it's in line with what the Department of Labor is stating. Similarly, if they're requesting leave for the expanded family and medical leave, they're requesting the name and age of the child, the name of the school or place of care, a representation that no other individual is able to care for the child. So again, very similar to what the Department of Labor is requesting. I do want to make note that they have provided guidance that you are to maintain those records for a period of four years. So just make sure that your record keeping is in order, you're maintaining the records necessary for people to take leave under the FFCRA and in order to obtain those tax credits. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jen. And so we have, so I know where we probably have 10-ish minutes left. So we, we had some great questions come in that I definitely want to make sure we get to. But I know, so given what Jen had just gone over with all of that tracking that has to be done, Allison, do you, I know we, we do things a little bit differently. Do you want to spend just a minute on how we, we do our tracking for this, this leave type of stuff? Sure. If your blood pressure wasn't up already, I imagine it just spiked after listening to Jen. I appreciate the the guidance, but uh, man, it's just it's a lot to manage. Um, we've been outsourcing our absence and leave management to our disability carrier for a couple of years now, um, and what that means is that um, when an employee is out on FMLA or um, maybe has a qualifying event for FMLA, when they're out for more than, I think we have a policy of three or more days, um, that they contact this vendor and the vendor walks through all their rights and responsibilities, all the leaves that they are, uh, may have available to them. Um, and what that has done is allowed to take, uh, to manage the privacy of um, these cases, um, and, but also make sure that we are fully compliant. Um, because, you know, from, for people who have an HR department or people who don't have an HR department, it's a lot to manage that compliance piece. and. Um, there's an, uh, a great deal of stress around that. So um, our disability carrier is Lincoln Financial, and uh, they've provided that um, uh, process for this as well. So they're going to collect all the documents necessary. Our employees have been instructed to uh, speak to Lincoln Financial, and um, uh, they communicate directly, and then they report back to us. Um, what um, PTO we need to trigger or if they, or remind the employee to trigger PTO. So um, it does take some of that um, stress out of it for me, um, and it's a, a definite consideration for our employers going forward. Well, thank you very much, Allison. I know that that conversation has come up not only now, but that came up with paid family leave as well with all different types of – there's been two major legislations come through with new type of of leave over the last, you know, less than a year. So I think that conversation is going to be coming up much more. Um, so I do want to get to a couple of these questions. So um, I, I know this one, I'm going to, I'm going to pick this one a little bit selfishly because I know I have a tough time with this sometimes, but working from home. Um, so when does the workday end? I know for me, especially now it's, it's tough where it feels like you're, you're up at 7 a.m. and you're doing things and all of a sudden you look and it's 7 p.m. and you haven't really stopped yet. So um, you know, when when are you having for those people that have to work remote? Um, when does the work day end, and how are you trying to help manage it so people aren't you know kind of overworking themselves? Uh, Lauren, do you want to jump on that one first? Yeah, I am also um, admittedly having a really really tough time with this personally. Um, so I am working from home, and uh, since 
the 17th, I've been at home. The first couple of weeks were so challenging for me because I would do exactly what you just said. I would wake up, log into my computer, and it seems like I would blink, and all of a sudden it's 6 p.m., and I never ate a morsel of food or even went to the bathroom all day. Um, and I'm like, where did the time go, and what is going on? And I'm sitting in this chair, and my muscles are probably wasting away. Um, so I've had to get really strict with myself about setting limits and actually scheduling breaks on my calendar. And I really encourage my team members to do the same because I know they were struggling with the exact same thing. Um, so I've put a lunch break, a half hour lunch break on my calendar, and you need to make that a mandatory meeting where you stand up from the desk and walk away and get something to eat. And then just scheduling like a couple of 15 minute breaks. Of course, there are gonna be times when you're in maybe a critical situation and you're gonna have to stay on a little later and work a little bit later, but I think as much as possible, try and end the day at your normal time that you would if you were in the office. Um, and just try and be disciplined enough to log off the computer. Um, it's all gonna be there tomorrow um, when you get out of bed in the morning. So I, I think we set those limits for ourselves based on the structure of being in an office and it's so much harder at home. But if you really kind of map out and block out time on your calendar, I'm finding that it's making it a lot easier for me. At large, do you want to jump in there too? I, I think this is a super important question because it's, you know, again, and it kind of ties into one of the second questions that come as well, where, um, you know, making sure that the, the staff is, um, you know, not overworked, making sure, again, we talked earlier about employee stress. Um, I know for me personally, I do usually a, a half hour, 45 minute walk right around lunchtime just to totally get away from all of it. Um, you know, kind of stick my phone in my pocket and try not to look at it and just go. But I think this is an important enough topic that I think if Laura and Allison, you guys want to weigh in here, I think that would be great. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So, you know, like everybody else, struggle with, you know, this morning is a perfect example. Got up, came down 6.15 this morning. I logged onto my computer. I'm like, oh, well, you know, and until I saw your email, Jeff, come across, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's I can't believe what time it is already. You lose track of time, you get involved, um, and you are, you know, very focused on, on all the things that are happening um, in your organization. So there are a couple things that we've done. Uh, the first is we have blocked out on everybody's calendar time for department meetings. So the time to stop what you're individually contributing to, hop on a team call, um, be able to see people with the webcams and, and kind of connect. Um, that has really helped a great deal in terms of giving balance because um, it's a team meeting and there's a lot of um, collaboration and um, commiseration and it kind of gives people that mental break uh, from the task that they, they are doing. Um, the second is we intentionally don't schedule any meetings um, during lunchtime. So we kind of use that um, 12 to 1 uh, with intention of, you know, not putting a, you know, go-to meeting on somebody's calendar that uh, we're respectful of. People have got to get up and, and move and uh, critically important for mental health. I think one of the things from a mindset perspective is, you know, I, I always use the um, I get to uh, instead of I have to. Um, and, you know, just the whole reframing, um, but the balance between work and family and home life has really um, become even more blurred uh, in the work from home environment, um, you know, across the, across the nation. I mean, it was beginning to blur when we got the mobile and everybody has their iPhone in their pocket. And, um, but I think now when we have all of our laptops and our computers at home and our email is really accessible and all of our work is is sitting right there maybe on our kitchen table or our kitchen counter it makes it really hard so uh, to lauren's point the scheduling of personal time um, we've encouraged our employees that when you need to step away just shoot your group a skype and say hey stepping away for 15 minutes um, or set your skype to you know you're away for a time but manage your time um, for your mental health, for your physical health. Uh, I know I can certainly sit in the chair I'm sitting in for hours and hours, and then all of a sudden I have a moment and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so stiff. So, you know, doing some mindfulness exercises, uh, meditation helps, and then obviously getting up and walking and moving. Um, but scheduling that time, I think, is, is critically important. 
and Laura, that's that's fantastic advice. And as you were saying it, I'm realizing that I'm guilty of it as well because I actually scheduled a meeting at noon today with with someone on you know my service team to talk about a client. Just not even thinking, I was just looking that you know okay, this webinar is going to end. You know we are at 11:30, so it's going to end here. Um, you know in a minute or two. Um, but I just didn't even think. I figured give myself a couple minutes for to grab something to eat quick and just get right back into it. But I think that's really good advice for me personally, because again, I'm just used to never putting it down. So um, I probably need to spend a little bit more time respecting that, you know, 12 to one ish time and not schedule any meetings there. Um, so we are, we are at 1130. There is one more question that I do want to get to. Um, and then we can kind of, you know, for, for anyone that has to leave now, you know, thank you very much. This, everything will be recorded. So we'll hit this one more question. And if you can't stay on, um, you know, we'll get it out with the recording along with, the FFCRA FAQ with the leave request form and then the links that Jen spoke about, uh, we'll send those along as well afterwards. Um, so thank you for being on, but I do have one more question. And um, Allison, if you wanna if you wanna start with this one. So it was someone who asked about, you know, balancing the fun with the sensitivity given the situation. So whether it be, um, you know, just sort of the macroeconomic situation around the pandemic, or if you were an employer that had to, you know, deal with furloughs and layoffs, um, you know, how how are you balancing, or how would someone balance that that fun versus being sensitive to to sort of the gravity of some of the situations that people are in? Yeah, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, if you're if you've had to experience a furlough or a layoff, um, it's it's impactful, and um, I think it is challenging to get around that. You have that survivor's guilt for anyone who may have uh, uh, remained outside that furlough or layoff. Um, I, I think it's, I, you know, I think it's about getting information from the employees, um, soliciting feedback from them, and uh, listening to them, giving them space. Um, we have this suggest this. Um, uh, online suggestion program called Ideas for our Innovation. Our employees can submit um, suggestions and, in that area, and maybe that's a platform for some of these um, employee employers, um, some kind of anonymous suggestion um, platform that allows the employees to provide some guidance on how they think um, the organization should proceed or take next steps. Of course, you take some of it with a grain of salt. Um, but that feedback and, and letting them acknowledging the request, acknowledging the suggestion, and um, and and just being heard, I think it is uh, a, a big part of it. Uh, the fun, um, it doesn't have to be balloons and rainbows and unicorns. I think um, fun can be a text from your manager one-on-one uh, -on -one that says, hey, I'm thinking of you. I know it's tough. Um, or um, a uh, text to an ind indirect report that said, hey, remember that Super Bowl uh, potluck we had? The dish you made was awesome. What was that recipe? That can be fun uh, for employees with low maintenance and um, respect the relationship between the employee and the manager. Absolutely. And, and Laura, if you or Lauren want to jump in on this one as well, I think this is an important one because you know, the reality that, that we're seeing in the marketplace, at least on, on my end with clients, is that, you know, a lot of people are in that furlough layoff position and employers are trying their best to do the right thing. I think, again, going back to compassion, I think um, this whole situation has created sort of a, a an awareness of of compassion. And I always compare it to like going to a Patriots game. Everyone's in the stands. We're all cheering for the same team. And then you get into the parking lot trying to leave and it's like a war zone it's like all the people that were just cheering for the same thing 10 minutes ago get to the parking lot and now everyone hates each other trying to be trying to be one car in front of that next person to get out and just sit in traffic so i think the whole compassion theme has it's you know it's obviously a bad situation but trying to find that that ray of light i think there is, well, hello, there is Amy. compassion everywhere yeah absolutely i i would um just add that we actually at Rockland Trust, um, we conducted a focus group um, with uh, some of our, a handful of our employees, and we asked them 
Um, what is it that you would like to hear from us? How have we been doing so far with the communication? Do you feel like we're communicating too much or too little? Um, what types of things would you like to hear more of? Um, and that gave us a lot of information as to how people were feeling and whether the things that we were doing were appropriate or not. So I would recommend just checking in with your employees, see how they're feeling and see what would be helpful to them during this time. And that's actually, that's a fantastic segue into, so on, you know, on the back end of this, of yeah. this webinar with the recording, we're actually going to send out a survey as well. So yeah. I think we're, uh -huh. we're trying to kind of do the same thing as well, just to take That's a pulse of, you know, how are we doing at Rogers Gray providing information? Is it too much, too little? Is it timely, not timely? Is oh, it helping? Fine. Um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that, you know, Lauren, that was a great segue into, um, we are going to have a survey coming. So post along with this, this webinar recording, we're going to have a survey just to sort of do the same thing for us, just to grade us. Are we, giving timely info is it too much too little is it on point is it something that you're using at your organization would you like to see more or less what's the next topic that you'd like to see so i think that's a pretty good segue moving forward um to sort of close this out i, I think we hit a lot of questions i i hope i want to thank all of the panelists that came on obviously for taking it we know how busy you are in your hr departments respectively and you know taking an hour and a half out of your time along with some time earlier than this week, you know, getting ready. We really appreciate that. Um, there were some great ideas that were passed around, so we're gonna do our best to um, aggregate those and, and send those out with the recording as well. But we just wanna thank everyone for being on. Um, stay safe out there. You know, I think compassion was a big word that was that was used today. So, um, you know, we're, we're with you, with your HR teams. I know it's tough, but we are here with you. If you have any questions or you're looking for any advice, I know, you know, Allison's spoken to a, to a lot of our clients, but, um, you know, we'll be the resource as we can for any of these issues. So please feel free to reach out. Um, you aren't alone in any of this. And uh, thank you very much for joining this morning.